job you did of doing Roger Daltrey just now in rehearsals. Wow, well, thank you very much. It's cut early in the morning, 11 a.m., so I haven't woken up, but uh, what the hell, you know, give it a go. Tell everyone the song you did and how you came to choose that song. Uh, well, it's See Me, Feel Me. Ha ha ha! Uh, but oh, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> if you know anything about the Lynch Mob, I was all about that back in the day. Yeah. No, um, I, I didn't choose that song. It actually was kind of proposed to me through Brian. He thought that it would be a good fit, and I said, I thought about it for a minute, and I said, Well, it's one of the biggest songs that the Who ever wrote. Right. So why the hell not? And it's such a beautiful yeah. song. It and is it, a beautiful it's, song. It's, it, it really. You know, when you go, after you go into the intro and you go into, you know, uh, you know, into the chorus, it just, it gets everybody going. Yeah, it's more of one of their more dramatically musical yeah. pieces. Absolutely. You know, theatrical okay. sounding. Exactly. So I'll be doing that. See me, feel me. Um, and then uh, we'll, uh, won't get fooled again. I'll be joining somewhere in that mix yeah. too. Great. Yeah. So let's go over the songs that you're going to be cranking out on vocals. Ooh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I am doing Can't Explain, Join Together with the band, uh, Summertime Blues, and Bargain. Do you have a favorite? Join Together with the band. I get to play uh, Jew's harp on it. Oh, that's right. I saw you messing with that yesterday. Yeah. And uh, harmonicas. Have you ever played the Who in cover bands growing up or anything like that, or is this kind of new? I actually did do uh, Join Together once. Oh, cool. A long time ago, So, and I love that song. So, yeah. So, uh, I'm be fun did you ever see them no yeah me neither never saw them live unfortunately cool. oh, i can hear now yeah <laughs> how much of an influence were they musically on you and, and roger in particular um, you know i listen to everything so just as much as the beatles and zeppelin and yeah. you know i'm i'm i was a big sponge you know in the 70s so uh, just a kid so John and I bonded like, you know, more than the others. And um, I played guitar on his first solo album because he kept going oh. about doing a solo album with the Who went off the road. And I said, well, let's do it. You've got all the songs. He said, so who's playing guitar? And I'd been working with Humble Pie for two and a half years as well. And doing their sound. I've actually had cook and bottle washer for Humble Pie. But um, <laughs> so I pulled in Jerry Shirley because Humble Pie were off the road and we went into a studio and in three weeks had an album. John's first album, Smash Head Against the Wall. And it went on, and I basically looked after John's affairs and, you know, managed his business affairs and so on. Um, I mixed all of whose um, film soundtracks, other than Tommy. Oh, that's right. Kids Are Right, McVicker, the Quadrophenia, um, and so on and so on, you know. And John and I were just, and then basically I was John's main manager PR, you know. I was with him, unfortunately, when he passed in Vegas. I was in oh. a room across the hall and I got the phone call. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, from a friend he was with. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's was John's style. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, certainly did things in style. Yeah, well, he went to the play. What a way to go. You know yeah. what I mean? A good few drinks downstairs, upstairs, a lady friend, and not wake up. Yeah. For those of you that don't know, just that look was, it up. That would suit me fine. <laughs> Watch out for that guy over there, Phil right, Chen. Right. <laughs> you know, go, let's go back to the days and years of mixing those soundtracks which was groundbreaking to do back then that style of music put to film and all those things well, I built, did you guys realize what was going on then well yeah i mean i, I built the who's i was a major part of building the who's own studio we had a, like a rehearsal place over in battersea uh, it was basically a built is a, a deconsecrated church and we bought it for storage because most of the gear was in two trucks sitting on the street outside the road oh, houses. Wow. <laughs> so then they bought that for fifteen thousand pounds, which is these days is about like you know twenty two grand or something yeah. in dollars, but it was way, way back. And then it was like, well let's make it into a like a rehearsal place. And then Pete and Roger were walking around one day and it's like, let's make this into like a, a um, we could have like a little bit of studio equipment because one thing led to another and instead of being like a demo rehearsal studio it ended up being a full blown built studio right. which eventually when we sold we sold, sold to townhouse many big albums done there and because i built the studio I and mean, with my experience of playing guitar the other side you know being the other side of the window and that and also doing road managing it, it came as a natural for me like the mixing boards and so on so yeah. i didn't actually do any 
real training. I was kind of thrown in at the deep end and having put the studio together, you know what I mean? Right, right. Um, I just went straight in as like an engineer there. But when it came to the film track, I learned a lot of stuff. But, you know, you learn as you go along. There's, yeah, there's something good about being thrown in at the deep end because, like, you know, you just get on with it. And yeah. as long as you've got a brain about you, which hopefully I did, it, yeah. it all seems so because everything turned out successfully. Yeah. But it was fun doing the film track. So I was travelling backwards and forwards from England then, like where I lived. And... Um, Coming over here to do like you know the actual film clips and show reels and so on with Jeff Stein and a bunch of other people and it was a wonderful experience. It's like you know I did all the tape research for Kids Were Right. I had the studio in Wembley in England. Um, the room was like about thirty foot across. I had tape boxes about four foot if not higher off the ground all the way across the back. Wow! Was all, that like going all, back to two inch tape, back to quarter inch tape. Oh wow! An eight millimeter film with no soundtrack, and I had to match. Oh wow! I had to match soundtracks yeah. with a very speed. Just I used to do it manually as well yeah. a lot of the time because they would drift a bit. So after a few practice runs, you just sort of yeah. like you know, yeah, do it manually and like tweak it in, and we just put a soundtrack to an eight millimeter bit of shitty film. Yeah, long that before Simpty or any of that. No, we just used. Uh, it was basically sixty hertz or fifty hertz then. You know what I mean? That was it. it some. Simply wouldn't have helped us anyway because the film right. didn't have any code on it. You know right, what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. So it's just a matter of using the various speed and getting it like finding a track that suited that piece of film at about that speed and then getting the very speed. But even then, it would still drift fractionally, but you had the very finite, you know. And I'd do yeah. that by hand. Lenny, how, how much of an influence was the Ox on your playing and musically? I might get decapitated for saying this, but we got this back. is the first time I've, I'm actually going to play these two songs ever. Because um, I grew up more on the reggae side of things, yeah. on the Afrobeat side of things. Yeah. When it came to rock, it was more like um, Cliff Burton and Geezer from Geezer Sabbath. Yeah. yeah, but... I come more from like the Family Man, Larry Graham, Jacko-ish, you know, right, you know. Right. But uh, what I admire about Ed Weasel is that he was just a free player, and he yeah. he really took it, you know. Was not afraid of playing your the. Bass. He used the whole neck. That's me. Yeah. I like to use the whole bass. Cause otherwise, I'll just get a bass with four frets, you know. Well, and if I, you grew up on Jacko, there you go. I threw up. <laughs> no, Jacko, like for everybody, you know, it's been such a great. It, the hardest thing about Jacko is getting rid of it as a player. You know what I'm saying? Because he was so influential that that once you get in that path, it's almost addictive. You know, and then you got to stay away from that. To one be of, able to get back to carrying the bottom end, playing in the pocket, and all another, that. One of the reasons why um, I, I don't I don't do covers. I don't like to. Uh, unless they're paying me a lot of money, you know, because it takes away from from me, you yeah. know. And I'm at a point where now people call me because they like what I do uh, as a musician, as yeah. opposed to like come and do a, a, a rock or bass line. But yeah. when Dave Dave Garibaldi, drummer for Tower Power, when yeah. he called me, he said, "We're calling you because you're Pancho, not because we want you to play like rock or we want you to play like you." Keeping the integrity of the song, of yeah. course, and you know the bass lines that are the bass lines, yeah. But when then you play, you play. And you know what I'm saying? Yes. So it's different. You That's know. great. It's, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. You know? Are you looking forward to the gig? A lot, a lot. You know, I'm mean, like I love to play loud bass, and you know, yeah. like play with Dave Lombardo. He's one of my dearest friends. You yeah. know. And
so good. You sounded great, man. Oh, thank you. Looked good, sounded good. What do you think of that kit? It's fun. Yeah. Those toms across there, I forgot yeah. how much fun that Isn't is. Isn't that crazy? It really is. Ultimate yeah. Same size. Yeah. That's nuts. I Who know. does that? Keith Moon. Keith Moon. Yeah. yeah. I, I I heard a story that him and um, the drummer for Alice Cooper, uh, Neil used, Smith. Neil, Neil Smith. Neil that Neil Smith. That drummer. That one, yeah. Um, who's now a real estate guy in Connecticut, by yeah. the way. Um, that they used to call each other up and go, I just added a Tom. Oh, well, then I got to add a Tom. And they would just keep. Really? Yeah, yeah, that's what I heard. Oh, wow. So. That's yeah, cool. they were always like rivals with all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. What is your favorite Who album? Who's next? Because my dad would. Well, the first song I ever learned to play, a first full rock song, not like a Beatles song, like in my room, but right. actually on a kit, was Bab O'Reilly. And that's the oh, song wow. I wanted to do, but it was taken. Oh. Um, but, uh, and my dad would had an 8-track and would blast the, that whole record on 8-track in the car, right. you know? Yeah. And uh, so that's a, that's a big record for that's me. That's cool. Yeah. Real cool. Did you ever play Who songs in cover bands growing up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I did. Um, and, you know, I've, I've always loved Keith Moon, you know? Um, How can you not? I know. Although some people don't. You know, from time to time, we'll post pictures of Keith on the Drum Talk TV Facebook page. And it blows my mind. First of all, I want to back up. I don't understand how any drummer can criticize another drummer, period, anyways. No, whether it's a weekend warrior, white collar worker right. that plays sure. in a band. I just don't get the whole concept. But someone like Keith, who made such a footprint on the music industry right. and the drumming community... For someone to, it's okay if you say, I don't like that style. Sure. But to bash someone, no pun intended, for their playing, it just doesn't, I don't get, I can't get my head around that. No, it What's doesn't sit well with me either. The thing is, I mean, the Keith Moon, the thing that was so awesome about him is that it felt like it was going to go off the rails any second. Yeah. It was that recklessness. Right on the edge. And, and that, you know, and I mean, I think Simon Phillips is literally a god drum player. But him with the Who, it wasn't the same recklessness. It was a different kind of Who. Yeah. Now, Zach was kind of in between there, I think. But no one will ever duplicate that recklessness right. that he had. And a little bit with Poison, not that I'm putting arts in the same league, but CeCe pushes mm -hmm. and Bobby pulls. And I'm kind of in the middle and all that Holding stuff feels reckless in a different way. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's that... You know, people would just go, man, it really sounds live when you guys play live. And it's yeah. like, yeah, I know when it's on record, it's very pop. When it's live, it's very reckless, you know. Right. And I think The Who did that sometimes. Sometimes it sounded reckless on records, and certain songs sounded very produced. But yeah. um, That was a Zeppelin thing, too. They were two completely different bands. They you were, know, they were precision yeah. and very methodical in the studio. And then live, every night was different. I collect Zeppelin bootlegs. Sure. And it's like you can listen even within the same week of recordings, and every song is different. I think mainly because of Bonzo never played the same thing more than once the same way. You, you know, know what? When you push the envelope, that's what happens. You yeah. know what I mean? Otherwise, it gets boring. And that's why, you know, um, I think that people become immortal because, you know, lots of times um, it's that unpredictability that keeps you coming back. But if they're, if they're an unpredictable person or unpredictable soul, they're unpredictable in a lot of other aspects yeah. of their life, unfortunately. Exactly. And uh, I mean, the best rock and roll is still that very destructive. Yeah. I hate to say it because I'm not telling kids to go out there and do bad stuff. Right. But it, it just seems there's more stories, more on the edge foolishness that if you can keep it together, it becomes something epic. It was all about the Who. That's what made me decide I want to play rock and roll, man. And uh, my mom dropped me off at a matinee of Tommy when I was 10 years old, and uh, which is pretty wild for a mom to do, you know. But uh, I had a cool mom, and it just, you know, the movie was so abstract. I didn't quite understand the movie, and I don't know that people still understand the movie because right. it's pretty out there. But <laughs> awesome. But the music, man, it just took me away, and. Um, and John, you know, in retrospect, that was, you know, what got me wanting to play bass, you know? It was just so cool and driving. And Had you picked one up yet at that time? Uh, that no, I was really just kind of strumming around on some guitars, okay. you know, a little bit, and uh, some classical guitar. And, you know, not real advanced or anything, but it just made me go, that's what I want to do. And, you know, here I am, almost 49 years old, and I'm, I'm blessed to still be doing it. You that's know? awesome. 
yeah. playing the kind of music you like to play. That's the best part. Yeah, you know, and uh, and getting to hang with all these other great musicians and just have a great time. It's uh, the spirit of their music. It's just, you know, it's just the heart of rock and roll, man. It is, you know, it was nasty. It was beautiful. It was everything. And, uh, you know, everybody says the Beatles, but for me, it was the who, man. Talk about um, the songs that we heard you rehearse and how it came to be that those are the songs you're playing. Well, you know, a lot of the songs were already already uh, taken when I got on board, but uh, I love the songs that I'm doing. Well, the kids are all right, man. That that resonates with everybody, you know, and, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be doing that. And, um, you know, we, we're, we're killing it on Kids Are All Right. We got a three-part harmony thing going, yeah, which is really, great. really yeah. cool, you know. That song is like a soundtrack of our lives type of song. You know, it's one of those songs that people will relate to that as I remember where I was when type of song you know right and we're doing squeeze box another great tune uh, Tracy's just killing it on everybody's killing it. Ricky Rocket yeah. I, mean, I mean Tom Gimbel uh, Stephen LeBlanc we got a great lineup man it's, it's gonna be really really cool and the tone uh, that we've got on the bass rig is just I think Entwistle was like the first guy that I can remember hearing that used distortion on the bass yeah. in my generation and when that leapt off I mean it just fucking exploded off the speakers I was like holy shit swing you know and I think anybody that ever played bass got a woody when they heard that and uh, you know a lot of guys have taken it you know geezer butler and all those cats you know they took it you know and and did something with it and uh, I just wow man I think he was the first guy yeah I think you're right yeah. absolutely yeah It's louder today than yesterday. Oh, good. We're moving in the right direction. Yeah, exactly. Warming up to the actual gig volume. Thursday, Can't yeah. imagine. It'll be cranking Thursday. You sounded great. Go over the songs that you're singing. Give everybody an idea. and Tell us how you ended up with them and how they feel to you. Okay. Uh, a lot of the ones are from my childhood, like Pinball Wizard. Uh, I used to sing when I was a kid. so. Brian is the guy, Brian Tishy, that, that just kind of decided which songs for which people. So he gave me a, a long list. It's like a Pinball Wizard and the ones we did today, I can see for miles. And um, it's gonna, it's, they're going to escape me at the moment. I've been working on them. <laughs> but there'll be a bunch of them. Yeah, yeah, great, great stuff. And your voice is very well suited for the songs that you did do. Are you playing guitar on any of the songs? No, no, they got enough guitar players yeah, in there. But I, I thought I'd just kind of focus on singing, and that way you're a little bit more free with the phrasing and the rhythm. You know, you're not like doing two things at yeah. once. It's just great to be able to focus right on the singing. Yeah. Well, how much did The Who play in your musical training, influence, sensibilities? It, this was a huge deal for me. You know, yeah. The Who, it was a really, really big thing. I, I was trying to think about it. I think there's 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 messages in the songs. You know, I mean, Pete Towns is such an amazing writer. And when I was little, the first thing we heard was the rock opera. Yeah. And the first one, uh, you know, it was a great story. It had the characters, and it had a really cool story, and things got weird. And then there was like a little m a message in there about a messiah, you know, some biblical reference, everything you would want in an opera. Right. So that was great, and we just loved that. Couldn't get enough. And then uh, the second one, Quadrophenia, really, I think, is just a great uh vehicle yeah. for, for kids to relate to when you're growing up and stuff you know so much of that album he's writing about what it feels like to grow up to be right. lonely to want a girl Go through adolescence yeah and that thing about being in love with a girl but I don't know if I should tell her 
That question has never been answered. <laughs> That's true. We're still working on it. Did you see the movie Quadrophenia? No, I never saw it. Uh, I was like, we're probably about the same age. I'm probably a few years older than you. I think I was like 14, 15 when I saw it. And uh, it ties into with our whole age thing. What is it like singing songs? And with Foreigner doing the music you're doing with Foreigner, what's it like playing music that we grew up with? <laughs> well, it's a treat. And it's... Um it's nice because it feels organic. It, you know, I, I don't have to go anywhere. These are like my roots, you know, and that's that's a great feeling. It's just a natural match, and you can just tap into that. You know, I, I remember we used to have the books for for Tommy and Quadrophenia. When I was a kid, we would we would play through the books. We'd strum the chords and sing. We had a drummer and stuff. And I was telling so, we, you know, we played this stuff when we were kids, but we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> this is for real. These guys are just the best in the business. So uh, it's a whole new experience, and it's the thrill of lifetime. I also, <clears throat> what I do a lot is, well, for example, uh, what happened with uh, with this recent performance, The Ox and the Loon. Mm -hmm. uh, I really wasn't familiar with uh, with Keith Moon. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed the music, right. but the, the drums weren't in the forefront. That band like was, you know, uh, crossed my path very, very brief. I was really into, you know, more like the Deep Purple, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Zeppelin, mm -hmm. Uh, I was into a different style, you yeah. know, more a little more aggressive, and yeah. I felt like those bands were more aggressive. The Who was aggressive, but in a different way. They, they yeah. just, I don't know, they just really didn't appeal to me. So I had to really learn and research Keith Moon's style, mm -hmm. and I found that that guy had a punk, thrash attitude when he played. Right. It was just, it was ruthless. Yeah, You know, yeah. I never really... Uh, noticed that in his playing i know he was wild and you know but i think obviously with the help of youtube you're able to see yeah. these videos right you know that you never ever came across before i never would have known that you only recently started studying Keith's playing because the songs you played you articulated so well um, bargain especially uh -huh. you played three songs right yeah bargain, bargain going mobile going and uh, summertime blues summertime blues yeah and all three of those and especially bargain and going mobile are very solo-esque in a way from yeah, the, the drumming you know it's like constant mm -hmm. constant rolling and there happens to be three other guys playing along basically right. you know mm -hmm. so to see you play it so much in the spirit of Keith's playing I never would have known that it was all a new study yeah, for you which yeah is really he cool. really I was captivated I yeah. was captivated and I was just I go man I really I get it I know the kind of musician yeah. he was because I I I know his style. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of play the same as he does. Obviously, right. he's a different, you know, a generation, a different style of music. Yeah. But in drummers, there's feeling. You know, right. you have feeling when you play. Right. And he had that kind of thrasher. Yeah. You know, that angry, you know, violent, insane. Yeah. You if know, you look style. at John Bonham, Ian Pace, the other two drummers you mentioned, uh -huh. and Keith Moon. There's Polar three opposite. completely different. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah.
face in the mirror No, I'm worth nothing Without you In life, one and one don't make two One and one make one I'm looking for that free ride to me. 